Just because someone's on a stage doesn't mean they're ethical. And you know, I've had to learn some hard lessons. You know, you get into these masterminds where everybody pays to be there. People seem extremely credible. Well, guess what? That's where the biggest sharks are too. The money's great, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to who's your family, who's your friends. If you're around people and they're fake, what's the point? All right, Justin, thanks for coming on today. Excited to jump into it. I was reading up on you this morning. Looks like you've done some uh, amazing things. So first of all, congrats on, on all your success, all you've done. Honestly, it's like the American dream right now you're living. <laughs> it feels like that at times, but as, as you know, at every level, there's there's new opportunities, new challenges, and you never really feel like you made it, right? It's it's that never-ending pursuit of the journey, I guess, that keeps us in it. Yeah. I was like talking to my wife out the other day. I was like, you know, when people say, oh, I'm comfortable, I feel like, man, it's like kind of saying you're dead. You know, you always want to be, I feel like I always want to be moving and improving. I don't know about you, but that's just like kind of how I am. Yeah. It's really hard. I mean, I feel people that are, that are driven like this, um, it's the hardest to find happiness. Somebody who has, a, I don't want to say a low bar, but just what they want out of life is something they achieve early on, balance, all these things that someone like me just doesn't understand. You know, it's uh, it's very hard. It's like the book uh, Winning from Tim Grover. You know, you're going to work your whole life to to have these four moments or three moments, or maybe you never even get that moment of a championship. But I guess that's that's just how we're built, you know? Yeah, I think also, too, I, Ed Milet always says it. It's like there's maybe five or four things in your life that, like, depending on how they result, it changes the trajectory of your life. So I it's right. There's almost the same thing. It's like I think people think it's going to be this constant. It's actually sometimes just four or five big moments that really, like, add up. It's like golf. You miss those three big shots. You just lost a tournament. It's not even the 10 shots. It's the three. <laughs> Exactly. It's like, I'll be happy when I'll be happy when this and then you look back at all the things are past the levels, you never even thought you'd get there. Like, why does the feeling not change? And it's because you just have to understand that the pursuit, the journey, being in it on a daily basis is actually what you're looking for. And I feel like that's a, a maturity we all have to figure out. It's like when 22 year olds DM me and they're like, I feel like I'm behind. I'm like, I didn't even get started till I was 25. You got so much time. And it's just having that perspective so difficult. Yeah, I, unfortunately, it's just social word and now, 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 and you don't know who's real or not. And so I think the podcasts are great because we're long form. You break down who's real. And honestly, I feel like politicians, everybody should be on long form and just be real because this is what it's about, right? Not these five minute clips of what is that? Is that even real? You know? So I'd like to jump in just, you know, anybody doesn't know you, if you can just kind of give us a little bit of your background and kind of like how you got here and where are you? Where are you living these days? Yeah. So I'm out in Vegas. Uh, we moved oh, here. Right. I was uh, on the East coast my whole life. So I'm um, born and raised right outside DC. My dad was an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur, so I watched the ups and downs. I got to kind of live um, the big wins and then the big tragedies as a child, which really shaped me. I studied more about what to do with money when you get it versus how to build business and all these things because I just see this pattern of amazing entrepreneurs and business owners making a ton of money, and then they all have a story of where they they lost it all. So and sometimes multiple times because the personality that that builds a business, all the risks you have to take along the way, is the opposite of how to protect and then uh, multiply your money. So I kind of looked at it back. Backwards. I wanted to, to flip it. That kind of set, I guess, the uh, foundation for how I was going to build my life. That's awesome. And so I don't know, you're, I was reading you're part of a company with your dad. I think your dad started and you guys took an exit and that kind of brought you to where you're kind of cruising today. Is that kind of correct? If you can kind of give us a little about, about that. Yeah. So when I was a kid, he built one of the biggest blind companies on the East Coast, had an exit there. And then when I was in college, you know, your family wants you to go to college. And I was one of those kids that just, it was never going to happen. It didn't make sense. I was there for six years trying to figure it out. It made me feel completely inadequate because I couldn't get through school. And eventually I dropped out, started in sales in the company, but pretty small back then. Quickly became the top salesperson in the industry, not just the company, you know, that chip on the shoulder owner's son type thing. You know, you have, you have to prove yourself at a different level. Then went on to build teams, ran the whole sales and marketing side of the business and pandemic happened. We were in the organic food delivery space. So oh um, that gosh. was a good lesson. Yeah. I mean, you know, some, there is a big element of luck to business sometimes. And we were on the right side of, of, you know, COVID exploded our business and we were able to have that exit. And the whole time we're building that company, I was doing what I had to do. I, I am passionate about health and wellness, but I didn't love what I was doing, if I'm being perfectly honest. It was um, doing what you have to do to get to a level so I could go do what I want to do. And um, that took 15 years. So I think that's a good lesson for people is that you don't have to love what you're doing. You just have to love the result it's going to create. And when we finally had that exit, I had been studying investing. I had been investing in multifamily as an LP. 
all this private placement stuff, oil, gas, all kinds of things. And I wanted to be in that game on the GP side. So once we had that exit, I kind of went on a, a nationwide tour of high-end masterminds and um, just trying to meet the high-level people doing those things. And um, that's how I met my business partner. And, you know, a year and a half later, I'm a hedge fund manager and, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're doing fun to fun deals with multi-billion dollar companies and it's progressing very quickly. So it's just, uh, it's amazing how things turn out when, when you have the long-term vision of um, how something's a bridge to get you to where you actually want to be. Yeah. I think you made a couple, like I always say to my wife, we're in real estate, we do finance, we invest too. And obviously we're big about cash flow and make you putting your money to work. That's we're around realtors and people all the time that make really good money. But you know, these old realtors, when you look at them, like they don't own anything. They literally work till they die. They never invested. And it's kind of like, you weren't like believing what you're selling. And in my wife does commercial financing and there's brokers that have been doing it 40 years that know the market you never bought a building. Like it blows my mind. And I always tell people, I feel like everybody has a different relationship with money. Some people get it and they just need to get rid of it. And they, it's like, they got to spend it. They got to impress. And then I'm just the guy where it's like, how can I multiply this? Why I'm kind of like sitting here. And like, it's like, whether you like them or not, rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki is like, the game isn't just like make money or save money. It's that money that's saved. Can that money be working while you're making other money? Right. And so how did you resonate with that? Cause that's not something like you just wake up with. Did you read a book or like what got you there? Because not everybody has this mindset, you know? Yeah. I mean, so you bring up a great book, right? Rich Dad, Poor Dad. People can say what they want about Kiyosaki, but that changed my life. Without that book, I would not have understood the real difference between assets, liabilities, middle class thinking versus how the rich think. And, you know, there's and there's a lot of hate for just books in general. It's like at every level of the journey, there's a good message, right? Just because you're an advanced investor, you don't want to look back at that and hate on it. Like, And same thing with Grant Cardone's sales books. I would have never got great at sales in the beginning if I hadn't read those books. And now I look at them like, ah, it's corny. It's a little dated and all that stuff. But there's a purpose for these things. So I don't hate on any of this stuff at different levels. I needed all of this information. The book that changed my thinking about investing after that was um, The Lifestyle Investor by Justin Donald, which was thinking about re the return of capital piece, right? The infinite return, um, not just the numbers of does it make me 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 percent, but how fast do I get my capital back to redeploy it? And is the equity still there multiplying behind the scenes? This is how people build wealth. So I was so intrigued with with learning how how these things work and what you could do, because I looked at I read the book, The Millionaire Next Door, and it was the worst middle class mindset thinking of how to, how to save just a million dollars by the time you hit retirement. You know, like that's how the average millionaire did it. Well, I don't want to be the average millionaire, right? So it's like the information has to match where you want to go. So you need to re read everything with this filter of, okay, here's the information. Is it going to get me there? No? Okay, let's reject it and move on and get more information. So yeah, I, that assets versus liabilities thing was huge for me. But, you know, experience is a great teacher too, because- I've really struggled in the beginning with with the save and invest versus the spend. And, you know, I had these, I think this has to do a lot with how we set our goals. I was taught, you know, put the things you want on a sheet of paper, put the picture of the Ferrari on your dash, you know, and I, I had the wrong goals. The goal, what I really wanted was freedom, but all of my goals were things. So the second I was to afford the payment, it was very difficult not to go make the down payment and get the goal that I had been focused on. The, the, the focus was wrong. So I don't think you want to make your goals things. I think the things should come from the investing into getting financial freedom. And then when your passive income can pay for the toys, the experiences, whatever you want to do, it doesn't hurt at that point. And I had to learn that from experience. I remember for 10 years, I wanted an R8. It was on my goal pad nonstop. I finally was like, all right, I'm going to give myself this thing, right? Within three months, I had to sell it because it made me feel horrible because I knew I didn't do it wrong. <laughs> It's amazing that when you have the money and you can buy what you want and you get something, you're like, this isn't even fulfilling. It really was like you said, it really wasn't that, right? Yeah. It wasn't that. It wasn't the car. It wasn't the house. It wasn't, I don't know why. It's just not, you know, it's crazy. I think what's cool about you, I was reading, is that a lot of people we interview, they're just all in on real estate, which, hey, isn't a bad thing. Multifamily, it's not a bad way to live. I mean, it's honestly a great asset class. If you, if you know how to manage, if you have a good manager of the property, you understand debt and you understand how to buy right, I think, you know, the rest you can kind of probably figure out through experience. But how did you end up landing in multifamily? But also is 
what other asset classes are you investing in that you kind of really like? And then why do you like those? Yeah, I love that question because it's something I see with real estate investors more than anything. They asset discriminate. They really do. Um, and, and you never want to be all in on one thing. That's how you get hurt, right? So I knew that I wanted real estate to be the foundation of my wealth, right? At least 50% of my net worth I wanted in long, stabilized, slow moving, cash flowing assets that don't give me heart attacks overnight like the stock market does. <laughs> yeah. I get that. But I also understand like right now, multifamily is getting hurt. Oh, right? yeah. So if you're all in on just multifamily, your, your deals, depending on where you bought them, you might be under a lot of stress. If you would put 20% of your portfolio with a, a hedge fund that does trade stocks, but does it in a way that the downsides hedge, you know, stocks are flying right now. We're almost back to all-time highs, right? So it's, and I've seen this with investors who diversify. They have their main thing, the core asset they love, which is great. But when you start putting money into other places and other things, it's like the Ray Dalio portfolio. He's got 15% in commodities, 15% here, because when markets cycle and shift, rates this, um, economies this, other assets are going to perform well. So I'm not a fan of alternatives that I don't know and understand. So I don't think you should invest in things to diversify if you don't understand it. But that's why I leverage people's expertise. When I started in real estate, I was doing single doors. It was taking up too much of my time and, and I couldn't focus on the main thing that was bringing the income to even be an investor. So I said, it's a very wise decision for me to sell these singles and put my money behind a great operator in multifamily, not just one, diversify it, right? Spread it a, a, across several operators, not just A class, B class, or C class. I want exposure to all three, not one part of the country, but you know, spread it out. So I'm always thinking of diversification, not just in different types of assets, but within those assets as well, and the op operators, because no matter how much due diligence you do, the element of risk is always there. And great investors lose money sometimes. It happens to all of us. And if you haven't lost money yet, to me, I just don't think you're really in the game. It sucks to say it, but I agree. Yeah. And if you think you're never going to do it, I just don't think you're really taking any risk at all. Like, And you're only going to get so big, right? There's just no way. Name somebody they've lost. You just haven't. Look at Ray Dalio. If you hear his story, he lost it all. Then you, you just need to lose it a big chunk one time and you learn, right? Hopefully it's when you're young, not when you're like at the end of your cycle. Are you investing in your like stocks? Are you investing in crypto? What do you think of crypto? Just curious because you kind of seem like you're diverse and yeah, crypto is a no fly zone for me. Too volatile. Um, if it, if I was a crypto expert and, and I could see a competitive edge, then I would do it. Um, I think that's another principle: is what is your competitive edge? You know, where do you have an edge on everybody else? Because there is a winner and loser on the side of everything, right? So many people that were all in on crypto, they lost everything, right? It's, it's tough to see, but people have to learn hard lessons. I didn't understand it. I knew that anything that goes that parabolic, it's not normal. And, and I didn't want to touch it. Now, I will ride periods of euphoria with small allocations, less than 1% of the portfolio. So I did own some crypto. But when Bitcoin went from 30 to C, I just have a principle. Like if I get a double on a paper asset, I'm out. Goodbye. Yeah, yeah. My money in Bitcoin and I was out. I haven't gotten back in. I don't want things that go up that fast. It, it's because it, it can come down just as fast. So getting into the hedge fund space, partnering with multi-billion dollar funds and I'm um, starting to learn how it really works at a really high level. I would never put retail exposure on something like that ever again, because I can invest through our fund and um, someone with a eight year track record managing over a hundred million in US equity swing trading that's beating the S&P 500 over a double decade period. I'm going to have him manage the stocks and, and not think that I can do it myself. So a lot of this is just self-awareness. Like why do people think they're better at things than the pros? I just don't get it. So that's it. And I think that's interesting. I agree. I think a lot of people aren't really, it sounds like to back it up when you wanted to start to invest and learn, you first invested in yourself, which is spend money, basically go to masterminds. What really is you're getting around the, the best people, right? And so I think a lot of people are so cheap instead of that's a waste of money. And I've done the same thing. I was a part of Avenger Mastermind, which is a hundred mil. I don't know if you heard of that one, Dan Fleischman. Okay, Joel. So a lot of amazing people there, but then you just start branching out and you just meet a lot of people. What do you think changed from when you kind of started getting into the masterminds and then you sold the company? Now you're with the hedge fund, not just like monetary or your life, but more with your mindset. Like if you were to go back and talk to yourself that just started getting into it, right? Somebody it's like, maybe I got some money and I'm trying to figure out what to do with it and not be stupid with it. But now you're sitting in a much different place around, you know, crazy smart people that are making money. What would you give that um, advice to that young person? 
I would say that just because someone's on a stage doesn't mean they're ethical. Just because, <laughs> I mean, I've had to learn some hard lessons. You know, you get into these masterminds where everybody pays to be there. People seem extremely credible. Well, guess what? That's where the biggest sharks are too. I think you've really got to trust but verify at a very high level. And again, I had to learn through experience how things should be structured. If there's no PPM, if there's no third party reporting in place, all these things I know to look at now, I would have prevented myself from getting hurt a couple of times in investments. So I would have probably, you know, if, if I'm going into a, the private placement space, I would have probably tried to spend more money instead of just rooms, but getting mentored by one person that could teach me all the things that they knew. Um, and I did do that for um, when we sold our business. I'm not a private equity guy before. Now I'm working in it. And I kind of felt like a fish out of water. So I got some private equity coaching from a guy who had done nine figures in private equity. And it really helped me in my negotiations and the outcome of selling the business. So I think targeted relationships, spend money on something, not just like, oh, there's a mastermind, I'm going to go. But what's the intention? I want to I want to spend this money wisely so I can get some very targeted information that's going to help me with what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I agree. The more masterminds I did, I agree. A lot of people are on stage. A lot of guys are full of shit. I hate to say it. They're all, and, and now, now it's like, you know, hate to say it, but the Warren Buffett quote, it's always true. When the tide goes out, you see he's naked, swimming naked or not. And you're starting to see that the guys that were buying deals, raising money. Um, and we've been in doing real estate for 20 years and we're here in San Diego and we're around more mom and pa. So I've seen, we've seen guys go from a hundred units to thousands to th and it's their money. They didn't raise money. They just did the bird. They just caught it up. And so when we got, you start going to mastermind, you see guys raise money. You're kind of like, that doesn't seem like a good deal to buy. That doesn't seem like a good debt to put on there. And you start realizing like, do they know things can change like the wind? And like, and so I think you saw that. And then it's funny. I'm all always kind of like, maybe hire the guy that's like hard to find. It's not on stage. That's like, that doesn't even want you to hire him. Like, I don't take you. You're like, bro, how much do I have to pay you? Cause I know you're that good. Just what's the number. Cause it's worth it. Right. And that's what you're, that's what I learned is you're better off shooting with a sniper than a shotgun. And especially with coaching and around the right people. Yeah. Cause in the beginning, when you don't have the acumen, you're looking at a slide deck, you're looking at the numbers, right? Well, now I want to know, how much money is the GP putting in? Like, are we in this together or are you just raising a ton of capital and deploying it? And if it works out, it works out. I'm taking my acquisition fee. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, stuff like that in the beginning, I wasn't even on my radar. So some of this, I feel like you can accelerate your learning curve by reaching out to people who know and, you know, pay for their mentorship. But at a certain level, you're going to have to learn from experience too. So obviously we're in an interesting market right now. I do follow a lot. I'm very like, you know, I'm not in every sector, but real estate, the data, I follow that a lot. From your point of view, where you're sitting, a lot of people, are you kind of just sitting back watching? Are you being aggressive in some areas? But what is your kind of overall view of the market and where in the next 12 months, obviously you don't have a prediction, but where are you kind of thinking things are going to go and where you're going to maybe see some opportunities? We've been working on this for the past few months. You know, we always want to bring as much value as we possibly can. And our partner, Prime Corporate Services is all about bringing you a service you can't get anywhere else at a price you can't get anywhere else. Whether you're new to owning a business or owning a property, or you're an experienced property owner or investor, Prime Corporate Services is not only going to help you, but they're going to make the process so much easier. So if you book a call, the first thing they're going to do for you is help you understand what your business structure should look like. Your corporate structure, tax planning, estate planning, all of that. Maybe you're saying, I'm brand new to starting a business and all this sounds foreign and complicated. Remember, this company helps new people just getting started every day. They're going to help you form the entity that's best for you and walk you through the process. Before I found this company, we paid thousands of dollars to other attorneys, CPAs, and consultants to try to understand exactly how we need to be structured to be as protected as possible. We've also gone the other route and used online platforms to form entities which unnecessarily put us at risk. You guys, you don't have to do that with this company. They'll do all of these things for you at a reasonable price so you you never have to think about saving money at the expense of exposing yourself to liability. We've searched high and low and you will not find this much value anywhere else. All you have to do is schedule a free call today. Just go to primecorporateservices.info slash G-I-T-C-G. Once again, that's primecorporateservices.info slash G-I-T-C-G. We'll also leave the info for you in the show notes. Several things. I mean, the Fed yesterday didn't raise rates, but said higher for longer. You see the impact of the 10 year shot up um, yesterday yeah. and today. Yeah. So it's just, it's one of those times where I don't know where the bottom is in valuations on real estate. It's very uncertain. So I feel like a lot of people are on the sidelines and I am, but I'm patiently waiting. I want to jump back in on real estate, but I feel like 
when some of this debt matures that that's coming down, we're going to see some some great deals in the next year. So I'm patiently waiting on real estate. I think a great place to invest right now is private equity. You see the IPOs are coming back. Um, we just did a deal for Flexport. That's a $5 billion company that will go public in the targets in the next 12 to 24 months. And um, we finished a raise yesterday for SpaceX shares. So wow. um, just like, yeah, so just like real estate, you know, valuations have gotten compressed. Private equity got crushed. I mean, uh, valuations. Oof. Yeah, yeah. Right. So we think it's a great time to to get into those shares. So you see, you see the stock market kind of going like this, you know, rates, how much further can they go? I don't know. So you want to be ahead of it though, because the second rates start going the other direction, stocks are going to fly. Everything's going to fly. So we're um, investing in, in big private companies, um, the unicorns, three, three billion or more in um, annual revenue. And we look at a thousand, this is through our, our partnership with Innovation X. Their previous exits, um, Palantir, Uber, Lyft, Spotify, Airbnb, Jeez. some of the biggest in the last you know, 10, 20 years, they were in, in the best ones. And, and their worst performer was Uber, and it was still an 18% win. So that's the type of investments you want to get in that are, you're getting a, a bad IPO multiple should be a, a 2x. And we're holding for two, two to four years as the target on these. So I love that. I love the hedge stock portfolio right now. I was really negative on stocks, but... Um, you know, when you have a portfolio manager that has a robust desk, I mean, it's a $10 billion fund. They've got fundamental, technical, quant, algo analysis, all this stuff. And um, they've got max drawdowns built in. And then, you know, their risk ratio is five to one. I feel really good about parking my money there while I wait for opportunities in real estate right now. So when you park your money somewhere in a hedge fund, right? And it's, you're looking out, I'm going to put it, plan it there for couple of years or two to four years, what are you probably realistically looking for like on a return conservatively? Um, I mean, conservatively, a, a 2X would be bad. That would be a pretty bad IPO because we, we act as a liquidity provider um, to early venture funds or um, distressed sellers. It could be um, individual people with shares or distressed funds. So we're not buying these shares unless we can get at least a 20% discount to current market value. So if you look at the SpaceX deal, we just bought the shares at the valuation before they went profitable. So just the Starlink line within SpaceX is val the valuation of Starlink is what we just bought the whole company for. So SpaceX owns Starlink, Starship, Star Shield, and the plan. Of course, everything's projections and targets, but it looks like Starlink will be a spinoff. We'll get a liquidity event there. We'll get our equity multiple, and they'll own the rest of the SpaceX business after that. So there's all different ways that you know the money rolls out. But yeah, I mean Flexport should be a four to eight x in less than two years gross, and then you got fees and splits and all that stuff. But for the LP investor, if you don't mind tying up your liquidity for, you know, maybe five years at the most is that that's a long time to hold for one of these late stage IPOs. Um, but real estate's a lot longer than that. And, you know, you don't get any cash flow, right? So that, that's the difference. It's just the equity multiple. So it's really about what type of investor are you? If you want liquidity, the trading funds that swing in US equities, you can take quarterly distribution. So it's more like a real estate thing. Um, and it's only a one year lock on your principal. So you, you have more liquidity um, if you want to deploy it to other things. So it just really depends on you know what's the best fit for the individual. Yeah. So your kind of goal is with the private equity, if you can get an exit or get some cash, you can either put it back in or put some of that into real estate multifamily. And you obviously are, and obviously you get the nice benefit from the tax and the depreciation and all that. For real estate people, I would think of it kind of like wholesaling, right? You're, you're low balling, you, you get the property under contract for a lot less than what it's worth. And then you either rehab it and flip it, or you just assign it, right? So that's all we're doing in these big billion dollar companies is we're kind of wholesaling the shares, getting it beneath and negotiating them to a market value where we kind of build in the multiple up front. And then the company's still growing and you get that multiple too. You add them together and you get a, an outsized return. We do have a fund launching in the next 60 to 90 days. It's with an aerospace uh, company. It's more venture, a smaller company. And uh, we're launching specifically because it's like a real estate investment. So right now with the rates, you know, all that stuff, it's very uncertain, right? So this is not market correlated. This company buys old airplanes, specifically 757 Rolls-Royce turbines, right? They refurbish the turbines and then they flip them. So we depreciate wow. the airplane, kind of like real estate. So you do get a negative K1 and you get a 15% pref, one year hold. So yeah, because you can write off the airplane the first year, right? Write the whole thing off. That's a good model. Sheesh. So there's, you can do a lot in private equity. And that's kind of how we look at things is we start with, okay, who the invest, what do they want? And then we try to create a product that fits that. So this will be something that a real estate investor would love. You know, if you can get a 15% pref, 
doesn't matter what happens with interest rates, the market, and you're going to get the negative depreciation, you know. So when you buy the shares at a discount, is that because some individual is flighting the cash and wants it, or you're just negotiating because that company needs money? It could be a, a multitude of reasons. Okay. If an early uh, VC fund and, and you struck gold, you know, they spray and pray, right? They're going to invest in yeah. hundreds of companies. A couple of them are going to go unicorn. So they'll, they'll have a several thousand percent win sitting there. And they don't really care if they're going to leave 400 to 500% on the table towards the IPO because they already got what they wanted, right? They don't want to wait a couple more years. They want the liquidity event now. So um, you can usually negotiate better with that. And um, it could be a distressed fund. Um, that's how we got the Flexport shares. They had a problem somewhere else in their portfolio and they needed cash. So they were willing to sell those shares at a discount to whoever could close the fastest. Innovation X, our partner, they have the ability to raise a ton of money very quickly. They were able to liquidate them, you know, fifty million dollars in three weeks. So we wow. were able to steal those at a very, um, very low, you know, big discount. That's awesome. So is your kind of um, is your end game then is like when you kind of do this, is it really to start parking and buying more and more multifamily just for the cash flow? Is that kind of like one of the big, like not end game, but that's something where you're just really would love to get that cash flow bigger and bigger and bigger just for like, it's kind of like freedom and lifestyle. Yeah. I feel like it's the foundation. Um, I've got a pretty decent portfolio as an LP. Now that we're in the fun space, I think our next step into next year, when we think that the time's right, we're going to partner with a great operator and launch a real estate fund, put ourselves on the GP side of it. And um, you know, I'll start rebuilding my my multifamily position through our fund um, with with a, a partner, right? It's kind of the, the just the progression of the investor. When I was running a food business with my dad, I didn't really have access to be a GP. I wasn't in where I am now. So I was doing it as an LP, you know? I read too, you also have, are you doing coaching? I know I noticed you have like a course and it looks like you're really into health too. So kind of wanted to just uh, quickly jump into that, just about your course, are you teaching people or what are you up to in that kind of sector? Yeah. So with building that food business, we did a lot of our business uh, directly with referral partners that were health and wellness professionals. So you know, we were doing organic food delivery. We could custom cut and pack. So if I work with a nutritionist and they wanted their client to have six ounce, eight ounce, you know, whatever portion sizes. So, you know, I saw from CrossFit gyms, the chiropractors, doctors, everything. I saw everybody's programs and, and I kind of just put it into what, what I thought was a combination of all of the information that was out there. So I did some health coaching on the side for a while. I'm not doing that anymore. Um, the course, um, it's up there. I'm not really pushing it. It's it's not the main thing anymore. I don't know how long I'll I'll leave that up there, but it's it's good information. And um, I kind of changed it to, you know, if anybody buys the course, you know, you'll get a, a strategy session with me too. I love meeting people, right? It doesn't mean we have to do business, but I want to give anybody 15 minutes um, at the least, um, just get to know you a little bit. So yeah, it's, it's still up there. It's kind of a past life. Um, I was running a mastermind for a while, weekly calls, all that stuff, but kind of shut that down now that Kern's Capital is taking off and the, the mission's just got a lot bigger. We want to be at a hundred million by the end of next year. And I, I can't be doing one-on-one -on -one coaching if, if we're going to build that out. Yeah. So these days you're pretty much just getting in front of people that you teach it, tell them what you're doing. So you can raise the capital. Just, you're just meeting, 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 meeting people. Yeah. It's a lot of traveling, lots of events, stages, all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, just a game of raising capital. That's my primarily uh, my responsibility at the fund. So I run the uh, team of capital raisers and I'm always looking for strategic partners for raising capital as well. It's not just individuals. It's a lot of the capital we raise comes from people where it's not really their main thing, uh, but they have huge networks, right? They might have a big life insurance company. They might somewhere else in finance and, and they have a big client base and it's easy for them to refer. And then, um, you know, if we can build a relationship and it makes sense, we can make someone like that a manager of the fund. So that way we can uh, work together on, on the uh, capital race. Who are, who are you kind of these days? Who do you, what podcasts are you watching? Who do you like to see on, you know, interview and just kind of, who are you learning from these days that you like kind of, whether you look up to, or you just think like, Hey, these guys are, you know, great to listen to and learn from. Yeah. So, you know, I spent a long time being obsessed with personal development and education and I think there comes a point, um, there's going to be several break points where you need to be all in on execution instead of taking time to get more information. Um, you know, once it clicks and you see the path, like it's time to go, right? Um, so as far as podcasts and books and stuff, I'm pretty much doing none of it right now. I'm just all in on execution. I try to get into bigger rooms. I'm learning more in these family office clubs, you know, where the there might be 100 people in the room, but the net worth is 20 billion or something. Yeah. 
But I'm, I'm learning more from those one-on-one -on -one conversations and seeing those people on small stages. And then um, just being on um, investor calls when, when I get a qualified purchaser, which is the level above accredited investor, I can put them on a call with the managing director over at Forte Capital Group and um, let him help that investor invest with us, figure out the best path for them. And just sitting in on a call like that, uh, I'll learn more than, than any podcast. That's all. I just, I just wonder if you're going to say maybe you're a fan of like the all in podcast or something. Cause those guys seem to, is that kind of a world you're living in a lot, what they're kind of doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've, I've listened a little bit to the all in podcast. Um, I really appreciate those perspectives. Those are, you know, some of the most intelligent people in the world, but it's, it's different uh, when you get into, you know, all these people with securities licenses, they have to be very cryptic. They can't talk publicly, you know, he has a um, 506C hedge fund manager. I have more leeway to get on here and talk. I, I can post things on social media. As long as I'm only working with accredited investors or qualified purchasers, um, I'm not kind of bind like they are. So the information that you get when you're on those private calls, because even to get on a call um, with these guys, you you have to have disclosure sent to you, all this stuff. It's very private information. So you're not going to see it on a podcast. That's what I always say is the guys that you never see are probably the best, biggest badass guys. You know, it's like, uh, like if I can ever get an interview or watch, I always tell people watching Ken Griffin on what he's thinking about the market, just his level, like he barely interviewed. Views. It's just his mind because the guy is just, it's hard to sit him down and get him, but it's just that mindset of what he's thinking, what he's seeing at that level, you know? Um, yeah, it's all large macro, you know, fluff information. Oh, they're, yeah. They, not giving away the the sauce on the nada. Internet. You're not getting nothing. Yeah, you're just kind of getting a little glimpse of where he's looking. Yeah. What's your kind of goal? I know the hundred million, but is there a minimum to your fund? Can you talk about a little bit more that somebody is interested, maybe investing your fund or investing with you? What that looks like, the minimum, and just kind of how that you know kind of go down that road for a minute. So we're we're a little over a year old. This this fund is very new. Uh, we sprinted from zero to twenty million in the first year, but things have changed in the beginning. Um, you know, you're a young fund, it's all about your relationships. So even though we're young and we will we'll accept as little as 100,000 from the average accredited investor, the reality is, is that through us and our relationships, you're getting access into multi-billion dollar products where you could come to the table and say, hey, my net worth is 10 million, 15 million. And they'll say, yeah, we don't care. A hundred million or more for these guys to talk to you. So it, like, let that sink in. You have access to that through Kearns Capital. I don't know anywhere else where the retail accredited investor can have access to these products. Where are you going to get SpaceX shares, right? You might be able to get it through your financial advisor if you're a preferred client at Morgan Stanley, where you have 10 million or more net worth, but then it goes through an SPV and you buy it at market value. We are literally on the cap table. Innovation X has $500 million sitting on cap table position, and you can get access to that directly through us. It's unheard of for... Wow. You know, for people at our level. So that's kind of our mission is we we want to be disruptive. Innovation X is disruptive. They do give access to retail. No, no one else does that, right? So we want to make take that model and bring it down one more level and give the average accredited investor, retail investor, access to this stuff. It's never been done before. No, it's the same, but it's kind of like when Grant says, you know, you're never going to be able to take down a $200 million apartment building, but you're just not, just not even if you have the money, it's the relationships. It's this whole game that people understand that goes behind the scenes. But if you're a credit investor, invest with him, you could be a part of that transaction. And that, and this is almost on another level because you guys are just, you guys are involved in such massive companies that you can't even get that access to. Yeah. I mean, lo love them or hate them. Uh, what Grant did for real estate is what we want to do with private equity. That's awesome. That's cool. Where's the best place for everybody to reach you, learn more about you? So my personal website is toptierhuman.com. Kearns Capital's website is kearns.capital. And then we're all over all the social medias at Justin Freistadt. Please reach out. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Cool. So the final question I always ask Justin, everybody is, um, what's your definition of generational wealth? This has changed for me um, in the past year. That's I've cool. Been through, yeah, it's been, it's been the toughest year of my life. Um, in, in such a weird way, right? There's so many amazing things happening. We're hitting new levels in business. We also had some really difficult um, issues in our first fund that we rolled out before we got all these amazing relationships. A lot of tough lessons learned. My little brother got cancer. My dog died. Like All, all these horrible things happen um, at the same time that all this amazing stuff's happening. So for me, I just look at it differently now. Um, generational wealth to me is if, if I can't work tomorrow, I can pay my brother's hospital bills, stuff like that, you know? 
Um, and that that'll really like if you haven't been through some sort of tragedy, let it sink in, because if you do dumb shit like buy Louis Vuitton or a Ferrari, but then someone you love needs your help and you can't pay the bill, that's going to be some serious regrets. So think about what's important. Um, build the cash flow first. If it allows you to do stupid stuff with your money, great. But never forget the real reason why we're we're building this financial freedom so that you know we can take care of serious issues and we can always be there for the people that we love. Yeah, I mean, I've asked that question a few hundred times. I don't think I've gotten that answer. So that's uh, that's that's a good answer. I think that's a that's a good note to leave on. But I think that's true. I think we just live in this world where it's this Instagram. I need it now. Instant gratification. And just like you, and I have a lot of great friends that have money. And I think they've gone through things. Uh, we just lost a friend in our community. Um, this girl, Jesse Lee, she was a part of our community. She just literally died of cancer last week. And if you follow Ed Milet, he posted about it because he's personally- I didn't know. I've seen at least 50 posts about it. Yeah. So I was, she was a good friend and um, it was just kind of like, uh, she was good in that. So it's, I've had three friends in the last year die of cancer. So I get you and it's kind of like their families and stuff. So the money's great. All this crap you can buy is great. But at the end of the day, it's really comes down to who's your family, who's your friends, and you can open up, have good relationships and just be real and honest. And I think at the end of the day, for me, that is like the ultimate thing. If, you, if you're around people and they're fake and it's all fake, like kind of like, what's the point? Yeah. I mean, just being able to, you get, once you go through something really tough, you, you start to appreciate an average day. I mean, I used to be like, ah, it was an okay day. But if, if I don't have serious problems to deal with in that day and it was just a routine day, that's what a great day is. Well, Justin, awesome. I appreciate the time. Love the story. Congrats on all your success. Hope your brother is doing okay or hanging in there. So I'll send a prayer for him. But uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for coming on. And I really appreciate it. Absolutely. This has been a lot of fun. Look forward awesome. to Awesome. If you're already a real estate investor, you know that aside from cash flow, you also get huge tax benefits by investing in real estate. But are you taking full advantage of all the potential tax benefits? We've been working with Tim Looney at CSSI for a few years now, and he's saved us and our clients hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in taxes doing cost segregation studies on their properties. Let me give you a few examples. We bought a property in 2019. If we had just used straight line depreciation, we would have saved about $18,750 in taxes. But because we did a cost seg, we saved two $258,000. That's $239,350 more than standard straight line depreciation in the first year. The other great thing is if you're classified as a real estate professional, you can apply this to other sources of income like W-2 or 1099 income. And you can also roll over any unused depreciation to future years. If you've owned your properties for a few years already, don't worry, you can still do a cost seg and save big on your taxes. This is not tax advice, so consult your CPA to see if you qualify to take advantage of these benefits. Call or text Tim at 318-469-9861 to get your complimentary property analysis. Once again, that's 318-469-9861. And I'll also include his information in the show notes. You guys don't wanna miss out on these tax savings.